Welcome to Roland's Travels, and today we're just inside Somerset at Farley Hungerford Castle, at the village of Farley Hungerford. We're going to tell you about this castle. It is in ruins, although there are a couple of buildings, including the church, that we're going to be able to look around as we explore this most fascinating castle and its history. Let's enter through the Grand Gate. To our right we have the visitor centre and this is where, having parked your car at the end of this driveway, you return here to get your tickets and audio guide for going around. Just look how thick the walls are. This castle wasn't destroyed in warfare, it was actually demolished later in time and we'll talk about that through our tour. Amazing the amount of work that went into this. And along this wall here, this is the area where the stables would have been. Now as we get to this sign on the wall, it'll tell us that this is the 15th century outer wall. It was built in the second phase of the building programme for the castle. And of course reminds us that uh, the stables were most likely along this area of the castle. Now construction began in 1377 by Sir Thomas Hungerford and by 1383 the inner court was completed. Now the village used to be called Farley Montfort named by a previous owner and so Hungerford not to be outdone renamed it Farley Hungerford. It's built on the site of the manor house. Down in the valley and over there we're just in Somerset so over on the hillside over that direction is Winsley, Trowbridge, Bradford Raven, that direction, so that's Wiltshire, just over the river, the River Froome at the bottom. And all of that landscape was a deer park. Actually Thomas got into trouble for building this because he crenellated it, made it a castle. You can still see some of the crenellation on top of the towers there and uh, you needed a license or permission from the king to do that so he had to get a pardon from the king in 1383 because he hadn't done it. Let's take a look at this board here. Excuse my shadow. Now in the 15th century the castle was almost doubled in size by Thomas's son Walter, first Baron of Hungerford. He added the outer court to the castle incorporating within its walls the parish church of the village and he converted the church into the Hungerford family chapel and mausoleum. And we're going to take a look in there on our tour around it. Now the castle continued to use as a residence until the end of the 17th century. It uh, wasn't demolished by war, but was just demolished and the stone used elsewhere. Some of it going to Longleat House actually. This is the Westgate House. This served as a secondary entrance to the 15th century outer court to the castle. Inside and to the left of the gate passage there survives part of a spiral staircase leading to its upper floor. And there is the aforementioned spiral staircase. is behind where the staircase is there. And this looks like what was the moat, doesn't it? Let's go over the other side. Yep. There's the moat down there. Still got a little bit of a bridge someone's built by the looks of it over there. Let's walk back now, round down this path and then into the area where the church is 
and the inner courtyard. And uh, plenty of information boards here. We're going to take a look at this one. See inside the tower there. Take a look, closer look at that. So the inner court or bailey contained all the principal domestic buildings of the castle. Now as we go round, I am using one of these. We point it at the little box in the corner and then it tells us what to do next, where to go. Nice little tour. So it tells us now to cross this bridge. So we're going to cross the bridge. It's nice and sunny. It is a little bit windy, but I uh, hope you don't get uh, too much wind noise. So we have a sheer drop. Quite a way down there. On the other side. And as we go along, we should have another activation point to listen to. Go and see what this sign says. This is the inner gatehouse. So there were two large towers defended the 14th century entrance to the castle, and in the 15th century, a small fortified enclosure or barbican was built in front of the gate to protect it further. See what you can find out about the inner court. So just here either side of the path were the entrance towers. You can see that from the sort of shape of them. And then this area here was where most likely the original manor house stood. So now we're going to go down where this handrail is to our next point and see what we can find out. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also visit rolandmillward.com Roland's Travels for written form of the places I visit. So here we go, entertainment and display. So let's take a look at this one. Now this is the undercroft of the Great Hall. So the Great Hall would have stood on this, we'd be underneath it. We're going to go over that direction in a moment, where the kitchens were. But as we go around, we'll just take a look at this area. So all the banquets would have taken place here in the Great Hall. All the entertaining would have been done by the Hungerfords. And uh, a little sign here. This tells us this is the dice and withdrawing chambers. So this is the site of the Great Hall dice, pronounced it that way I presume, where the high table stood. And the ruins beyond formerly belonged to the withdrawing apartments reserved for the family and its privileged guests. So that's the area you can see the foundations for over there. looking back down the length of the Great Hall. The rich loved their Great Halls. It was a great place to entertain people. And uh, they would show their wealth and possible generosity to people, doing their networking, etc. in the Great Hall. Well, let's just walk now down the Great Hall. The most important people would have sat at the top, the dais there. And then as you went down the length of the hall with tables either side, 
those less important would have found themselves at the bottom. Probably something that can still happen today, isn't it? So we're approaching the well, actually. So let's take a look at the well. That must have had to go a long way down in order to get any water from this hillside. Strategically, the castle wasn't really built in the best place because normally you have a castle on very high ground. Well, certainly to one side we have a big drop for defence, as you can see. But on the other side, there's a hill above. So if it were to be attacked, which it was taken um, at one point in the English Civil War, but rot destroyed and the hunger of her family eventually got it back. The Hungerfords were parliamentarians. So as that sign tells us, this was the garden. Close to the withdrawing rooms for the family so they could come out and take a walk around there. Relatively small garden, I would imagine, looking at it. Let's just go back along here, see how thick the walls would have been. And uh, down below we have a private home. Nice thatch cottage. Another information board coming up now. Let's go and take a look at this one. Okay, we'll just look over the wall first of all. And there's the bridge across the moat. Another view. cottage. Ah, so this board is going to tell us about food and drink. So basically this is the service area of the castle where food and drink were prepared for the Hungerford household and its guests. Throughout the Middle Ages this combined body could regularly have swelled into hundreds. So to cater efficiently for such numbers the staff would have been divided into specialist teams, each responsible for particular tasks activity would have been fast, furious and highly organised. So to our right are the remains of the great kitchen with its two great fireplaces. This is probably a two-storey building open to the roof with a louvre to let out the intense heat and beyond the kitchen of course is the well that we've seen earlier. There's possibly a bakehouse and pastry kitchen remains over there too. Excavations in the 19th century have unearthed the remains of an ash pit and a furnace, probably for the kitchen waste. Now it was probably that furnace that Lady Agnes Hungerford caused the body of her first husband to be burned. That's an interesting story. He was murdered to clear the way for her marriage to Sir Edward Hungerford and Lady Agnes was tried and hanged for the crime in 15. 23. Not a very pleasant lady was she? To get her hands on Sir Edward Hungerford's money no doubt it was her plan. So let's make our way up now to what is called the Lady Tower and find out a story about that.
So here's the information board for the Lady Tower. So we are, we are here at the Lady Tower and this is one of the four towers erected at the corners of the castle in the 1370s, divided into five floors. You can see that on the illustration there. So it contained probably bed chambers for members of the Hungerford household. Now it's properly supposed that Elizabeth, the third wife of Lord Walter Hungerford, was imprisoned in this tower in the 1520s. In a remarkable letter that she wrote to Sir Thomas Cromwell, minister to King Henry VIII, she complained of being imprisoned in the tower at Farley Hungerford Castle for several years without comfort of any creature. She feared her husband had sent his chaplain to poison her, but the villagers kept her fed, coming to her great window in the night. Her husband was actually later on executed for homosexuality. So as we look in the Lady Tower, we have a fireplace there. The opening you can see there and further up, they were actually the latrines or toilets where someone would use that and it would drop into the moat. And you see another fireplace just there as well. And just below the roof there, you've got more fireplaces as we bring the camera down you'll see them. So castles were not necessarily always cold. Perhaps we think of that looking at stone nook now and particularly with uh, this being in ruins. But a castle would have had lots of fires going. Let's move on now to the priest's house. To go back across the bridge and then turn left a little further along here. We've got a whole group in Americans with an author giving them a tour around the castle at the moment. Oh, it's a doggy! It's a doggy? So this direction will now lead us to the priest's house, so we're going to go there. As you can see, some of this was actually rebuilt. Very strong sunlight. So this was built in 1430 and it continued until 1959. So let's go and take a look inside the priest's house. So these are tomb fragments that we see here.
we have a model we can take a look out of the castle around 1600 this is So this is one heck of a family tree. So we just come up the staircase, see what's up here. some pottery shards and some that have been pieced back together again. So that's a 13th century baluster jug. Stonework characters there. Through here. Candlesticks and a crucifix. They're probably early eighteenth century and Spanish. go to the chapel and take a look round. Nice area with a tree. So the crypt to go and have a look at afterwards. In 1779, the castle chapel, which was formerly the parish church, was repaired and became a museum of curiosities. Now, the murals were also uncovered in its walls in 1884. And recently, in fact last year, 2021, then English Heritage have been doing some preservation work on the new walls. Coming up now we have the burial place of Sir Thomas Hungerford, who died in 1397. His second wife, Dame Joan, she died in 1412. So now we're heading down to the crypt.
So lying in the crypt are these eight lead caskets. They're known as anthropoid coffins and they contain the remains of Sir Edward Hungerford III. He died in 1648 and the family of his successor, Sir Edward Hungerford IV, known as the Spendthrift. He's the one who had to sell Farley in 1686 to pay off his debts. There are also six other individuals here, two of whom are obviously children from the size of the coffins. Now, interestingly, uh, these coffins would have contained pickled spirit, and that would enable the physical remains to be kept together after death. And there came a time, though, when a strange thing happened, that Farley Castle became a bit of a gruesome place to visit because of these, and holes were drilled into the lead, and samples of the corpse-infused spirit were offered to those bolder thrill-seekers for tasting. Hmm, not for me, thank you. Now we've seen inside the crypt, let's go back to this tower area. We didn't have a look around this one. This was on the walkway through to the priest's house earlier and we passed it so we'd just like to go along and take a look at it now. So this is the pathway leading to that tower. We'll go through the gateway or through the doorway I should say and take a look at that. Beautiful blue sky today isn't it? Take a look inside this tower. Certainly had very thick walls, didn't they? Let's look at the thickness of that. Got all the nook and crannies as we go around. Another room here. Well, thank you for joining me here at Farley Hungerford Castle at Rowland's Travels. Please do subscribe to the channel before you go. And if you'd like more information about Farley Hungerford Castle, if you're watching this directly on YouTube, make sure you visit rowlandmillward.com. The link is in the description below. Do subscribe and you can get every new update, every new article, every podcast that I produce sent to your inbox directly to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being one of Roland's travellers and I hope to see you again very soon.